Hello from the Channel Studio in London and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world. I'm Teniola Uyitayo. On the program this week, US President Joe Biden delivers an emotional farewell speech at the Democratic National Convention, plus Gaza reports its first polio case in 25 years as the United Nations calls for a humanitarian pause to facilitate mass vaccination. We begin in the United States, where a tearful Joe Biden took center stage on the opening night of the Democratic National Convention, delivering a farewell speech to the party he has served for half a century. This follows his reluctant decision to end his re-election bid in July, endorsing Vice President Kamala Harris to lead the Democratic ticket. And now... I would like to introduce my father, your 46th president of the United States, Joe Biden. An emotional reception for Joe Biden as he took to the stage on the first night of the Democratic National Convention. The 81-year-old wiped away tears after his daughter, Ashley Biden, introduced him to the crowd. Instead of his hoped-for high-profile speech to accept the Democratic nomination for another four-year term, Mr. Biden was the main event at the start of the convention. He praised Kamala Harris and her running mate, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, as the best hope for preserving American democracy. It's, the, it's been the honor of my lifetime to serve as your president. I love the job, but I love my country more. I love my country more. And all this talk about how I'm angry at all those people who said I should step down. That's not true. I love my country more and we need to preserve our democracy. In 2024, we need you to vote. We need you to keep the Senate. We need you to win back the House of Representatives. And above all, we need you to beat Donald Trump. And elect Kamala and Tim. President and Vice President of the United States of America, selecting Kamala was the very first decision I made before I became, when I became our nominee. And it was the best decision I made my whole career. We've not only gotten to know each other, we've become close friends. She's tough. She's experienced. And she has enormous integrity, enormous integrity. Her story represents the best American story. The president's reluctant decision to step aside on July the 21st came after heavy pressure from party leaders who worried the 81-year-old incumbent was too old to win or serve four more years. I think it just adds to his legacy. Joe Biden is exactly who he has always been, a patriot, a hero, someone who is selfless and loves this country above himself. Listen, I thought this entire night was electric. Uh, I was moved uh, the whole night and we finally gave our president his due and I'm very proud to have voted for him. I'm so proud of my president. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm thankful to be a Democrat and I'm thankful to carry this message forward. Kamala Harris, whose campaign has broken fundraising records, packed arenas with supporters and turned opinion polls in some battleground states in the Democrats' favor, thanked Mr. Biden for his leadership.
tonight. Joe, thank you for your historic leadership, for your lifetime of service to our nation, and for all you will continue to do. We are forever grateful to you. Thank you, Joe. And looking out, looking out at everyone, I see the beauty of our great nation, people from every corner of our country and every walk of life are here, united by our shared vision for the future of our country. And this November, we will come together and declare with one voice, as one people, we are moving forward. With optimism, hope, and faith, so guided by our love of country, knowing we all have so much more in common than what separates us, let us fight for the ideals we hold dear, and let us always remember, when we fight, we win. Later on, former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton took to the stage to a standing ovation. While she took shots at Donald Trump, who defeated her in 2016, she also spoke of her and Harris's place in history as trailblazers for women in the U.S. There was 2016 when it was the honor of my life to accept our party's nomination for president. Nearly 66 million Americans voted for a future where there are no ceilings on our dreams. And afterwards, we refused to give up on America. Millions marched, many ran for office. We kept our eyes on the future. Well, my friends, the future is here. Meanwhile, as Democrats gathered for the convention, thousands of people assembled at a nearby park to protest the party's military support for Israel's Gaza offensive. President Biden's administration's position on the Israel-Hamas war, now in its 11th month, has reduced support for Democrats among Muslim and Arab voters, who represent crucial votes in election battleground states. Kamala Harris has expressed her sympathies for the Palestinian people and what they're going through. but. Nice words is not enough. We want action. And that's why we're here saying that she should call for an arms embargo. She should say that the United States should not be giving this rock solid support to Israel. She should say that the U.S. shouldn't be vetoing uh, resolutions at the United Nations. She should show us that her policy is not going to be the same one as Joe Biden's. I definitely will not be voting for Kamala. Uh, she's been his right-hand man, and we've heard her stance on Israel. That's that's a big game changer for us. If they're not going to change their uh, policy on, on on Israel and supporting them with all arms and keep giving them uh, billions and billions of dollars to commit genocide in our country, uh, I cannot have no conscience to vote for her. The protesters were fewer than the tens of thousands organizers predicted, but a splinter group left the main march and breached a security perimeter near the convention center, with riot police detaining four people. Now to the ongoing conflict in Gaza, where Israeli armed forces continue their offensive. Displaced children and their families are facing a new threat, an imminent polio outbreak. Polio was eradicated in Gaza 25 years ago, but with vaccine coverage dropping since the war began 10 months ago, the risk is rapidly rising. <laughs> Palestinian mother, Gada, currently lives in the Nuzarat refugee camp, located in the middle of the Gaza Strip. She worries that her son, Mohammed, could be infected with polio 
as Palestinian Health Ministry confirmed the first case in the Gaza Strip on Friday last week. I am afraid that it will worsen and we would have more polio cases spreading in children. We want polio vaccination for kids at an early stage so that the children will be vaccinated before they get worse. My son was deprived from the first vaccine in the first month and that's why I brought him to the hospital because it didn't get enough treatment. Mohammed, now just a month old, started developing skin rashes only three days after his birth, increasing his mother's worry that other symptoms and diseases could follow due to lack of hygiene and medical supplies in the region. The Palestinian Health Ministry confirmed the first case of polio in the city of Deir al-Bala for a 10-month-old baby who had not received any polio vaccination dose. We declare today that there have been a case of active poliomyelitis uh, recorded in Gaza Strip. The case uh, involves a child, actually a newborn, he's only 10 months old, and he never had the chance to get his vaccination before. Because as you all know, due to the war, due to the destruction of most of our health facilities, this child never been given the chance to get two drops of the polio uh, vaccination. This occasion, I urge all the international community and all those who control what happens in the world, first, to stop this severe war on Gaza. The destruction should stop now. Ceasefire should be implied now. Second, there should be a safe haven for those, our medical and health teams that will work in order to give the vaccination. Hundreds of thousands of displaced Palestinians are crowded into tent camps, lacking clean water or proper disposal of sewage and garbage. Polio is a highly contagious virus that can invade the nervous system and cause paralysis. Children under five are most at risk from the viral disease and especially infants under two since normal vaccination campaigns have been disrupted by 10 months of conflict. Public health officials and aid groups say without proper health services, the population of Gaza is particularly vulnerable to outbreaks of disease. We got notified in mid-July that um, sewage samples collected from uh, different sites in two uh, governorates, uh, uh, Dar al Bala and Khan Yunus, uh, tested positive for uh, circulating vaccine variant uh, polio virus. And the genetic nature of these uh, viruses tells us that they have been circulating in Gaza for some time, maybe as early as since September of, uh, of last year. And given the conditions of uh, uh, displacement, overcrowding, um, uh, sewage contamination, lack of clean water um, and overcrowding, these are ideal conditions for a very high force of uh, poliovirus transmission, which is transmitted fecal orally. The United Nations Secretary General has called on all parties in the Gaza conflict to provide concrete assurances for humanitarian pauses, allowing a polio vaccination campaign to be conducted. Let's be clear. The ultimate vaccine for polio is peace and an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. But in any case, a polio pause is a must. It is impossible to conduct a polio vaccination campaign with war raging all over. Polio goes beyond politics. It transcends all divisions. And so it is our shared obligation to come together, to mobilize not to fight people, but to fight polio, and to defeat a vicious virus that left unchecked with a disastrous effect 
not only for Palestinian children in Gaza, but also in neighboring countries and the region. More than 1.6 million oral doses of polio vaccine are set to be delivered to Gaza, and aid groups are preparing to vaccinate more than 600,000 children in the coming weeks. However, the challenges are grave, with health, water and sanitation systems in Gaza decimated and most hospitals and primary care facilities not functional. After the break, we shift focus to another major health concern as experts race to contain the spread of a new monkeypox virus. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on the program. The Democratic Republic of Congo is at the epicenter of an MPOX outbreak, which the World Health Organization recently declared a global public health emergency, with the international community scrambling to source enough vaccines. Displaced communities remain the most vulnerable and in need of support. Since the outbreak began in January 2023, there have been around 27,000 cases mainly among children in the DRC. These are among hundreds of thousands of people forced to flee violence in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo to camps near the city of Goma. But now, having found sanctuary, they've come up against a different threat. A new variant of MPOX, a viral infection transmitted through close contact, is spreading with children appearing to bear the brunt of infections. I don't know how or by whom my child had been contaminated. I just watched helplessly as the symptoms appeared on her body. This hospital north of Goma is currently receiving many patients with suspected cases. Since we opened here about two months ago, we have received 260 patients. Among them, there are suspected and confirmed cases. There are some patients who are here in isolation and other patients have been treated and cured and have already returned home. MPOX is usually mild, but it can kill. It causes flu-like symptoms and pus-filled lesions on the body. The outbreak in the Congo began with the spread of an endemic strain known as Clade 1. But a new variant, Clade 1B, appears to be spread more easily through routine close contact. It has spread from Congo to neighboring countries, including Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda and Uganda. <laughs> On the 14th of August, the World Health Organization determined that the upsurge of MPOX in the Democratic Republic of Congo and a growing number of countries in Africa constitutes a public health emergency of international concern. MPOX has been reported in the Democratic Republic of the Congo for more than a decade, and the number of cases reported each year has increased steadily over that period. Last year, reported cases increased significantly and already the number of cases reported so far this year has exceeded last year's total, with more than 14,000 cases and 524 deaths. The detection and rapid spread of a new clade of MPOX in Eastern DRC, its detection in neighboring countries that had not previously reported MPOX, and the potential for further spread within Africa and beyond is very worrying. In addition to other outbreaks of other clades of MPOX in other parts of Africa, it's clear that a coordinated international response is essential to stop these outbreaks and save lives. A case of the new variant has also been confirmed in Pakistan and in Sweden and linked to the growing outbreak in Africa. We repeat that However, the World Health Organization has advised against any travel restrictions to stop the spread of MPOX. We do stand with what is recommended under international health regulations, which is that there's no need to close borders uh, when we are in disease outbreaks. Diseases don't recognize borders. People will continue to cross a border, whether it is a legal crossing or a not an illegal crossing. It doesn't stop a disease from spreading. Yeah, our standing recommendations are exactly as was outlined by my colleagues from IFRC, that um, 
we do not recommend uh, closure of borders. We do not want to see closure of borders. Last month, Congo approved the use of two MPOX vaccines. However, funding remains a significant challenge and only a few countries have offered to donate shots. When it comes to the MVM, uh, uh, MVABN vaccine, currently uh, about half a million doses are in stock at the moment that can be procured uh, uh, by countries or uh, other entities. Uh, another uh, 2.4 uh, million could be produced uh, by the end of this year if request, if uh, buyers are there to uh, uh, make a firm uh, procurement request. And for 2025, there could be another 10 million doses uh, produced, but there needs to be a firm request for those manufacturers to plan for the production. When it comes to the LC16 vaccine, this is a very special vaccine in terms of that this vaccine is not commercialized, but uh, at the moment uh, produced on behalf of the government of Japan. In previous uh, uh, incidences, the government of Japan was very generous when being asked to donate vaccine to countries. And this is also one way for WHO to work with uh, countries and with the government of Japan to facilitate donation of the LC16 vaccine. MPOX is a viral infection that is transmissible both among humans and from animals to humans. Clade 1 can kill up to 10% of those infected, according to reports. The virus can spread through close physical interactions and contaminated items such as bedding, clothing or needles. Finally, as we end the program, we head over to Cote d'Ivoire to see how rice farmers are adapting to unpredictable weather conditions. Many are turning to a new rice variety to boost yields and increase profits. Take a look. Ivorian rice farmer Francois Kaseyao struggled to make ends meet with only one harvest per year before he planted a new variety resistant to unpredictable weather conditions capable of producing larger yields. The grain, introduced as part of a program designed to increase outputs of the regional staple food and cut dependence on imports, allows rice growers to get two harvests per year, with a yield of up to five metric tons per hectare. Today the yield is better with this new variety. Before we had other varieties and we couldn't get by. But since we started with a new variety, we're doing just fine. We can get four or five tons per hectare. I can truly say that rice nourishes us today. This shift signals a potential boost for local farmers and the nation as a whole, which could reduce its reliance on foreign rice imports. Before the introduction of the new program that includes better irrigation, mechanization and improved short-cycle drought-resistant seeds, farmers struggled to produce one metric ton per hectare in some areas. We won't be talking about climate change. It's as if the weather has remained unchanged. When you plant it, whatever the weather, it adapts. It's good. It adapts to all climates. Ivorian production of local white rice currently stands at 1.4 million metric tons, far below the national consumption of 2.1 million. But the Agency for the Development of Rice Sector, Adepuy, says the latest investment of 330 billion CFA francs, that's about $551.38 million made by the state, its partners and the private sector will enable the country to be self-sufficient in three years. In our projections for 2027, three years from now, we should be producing around 2.2 million tons of rice. But all this will depend on figures gathered by the National Statistics Institute, which will give us the level of consumption habits and the different varieties we consume. Based on these details, we will be able to make a good projection. To fully cover domestic demand, Côte d'Ivoire imports rice mainly from countries such as India, Thailand and Pakistan. A decision by India to curb its imports last year has raised shortage concerns in several African countries. 
And that's the program for today. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelstv.com. Thank you for watching. I'm Teniola Oyetayo. Bye for now.